Korah chapter 9. Korah did not like the telephone. She did not like to use the phone. She hated to hear her telephone ring. She had no patience for it. She felt it was a waste of time. If you need the phone, she said, use it. But just to chat? No. What's the point? What's the point of that? Get together and chat, write letters, whatever. She just didn't didn't like the phone. She had a functional phone in her living room and an extension phone in her bedroom. The only reason was in the the event something major happened and she needed to call an ambulance, she said. If I need immediate help, the fire department, the police department, otherwise, what's what's the point of it? So I was very, very surprised the morning my phone rang and it was Cora on the other end. Well, you can imagine what I thought. A disaster. Something horrible has happened. There's only one explanation for that, but no, I was wrong. Um, she had a very upbeat sound to her voice, like a, you know, uh, cheery, just downright almost giddy. So I, to be honest, I wondered, um, is age catching up with her? Uh, does it happen that quickly? I don't know. I didn't have any experience with that sort of thing. These changes that come with age and with, you know, uh, people's health, mental acuity beginning to change. <laughs> so I was worried, actually. Now, that sounds bizarre, that I was worried that she sounded, what, happy? She wanted me to come over. She was going to make lunch. Now, I knew what it would be. Meat and potatoes, because that was her thing. And a veggie. Always a tomato. I looked forward to it. I I did. Um, So I kind of scurried around. And uh, I popped into the grocery store to get some of those, you know, $5.99 flowers to decorate her table. Just, um, Just a little cheery something. And when I got there... She was wearing something I'd never seen her wear before. <laughs> she was wearing an apron, you know, an apron that, that uh, I, I think they're called bib aprons because they, they slip over your head and the top covers your, the top part of your torso and then you tie it around and then the bottom covers you, the bottom part of your torso. It gives you great coverage from uh from cooking and I never seen her in an apron. I didn't know she owned an apron. It's very pretty. And I wanted to ask but I didn't want to make her feel funny about wearing an apron. So I just took it in, found a little vase and put the flowers in it while we were chatting and she was finishing up cooking. Smelled very good. The food smelled so good. It was very hungry. And she had the table all set, uh, very dressed up. The table settings were very dressed up. With dishes I'd never seen before. I, I was starting to get worried. I, I truly was. It's like, there, there's bad news coming. She's something. Uh, I, I, there is, um, she's being happy, but... I, I, I was very concerned. And so she uh, asked me to pour some iced tea for us with lemon. And I did that. And it was sweetened tea, which was really not my favorite. But I added lots of lemon. So that helped cut the sugar taste a bit. Which she only used pure cane sugar in her coffee and her tea. So we sat down and we made small small talk, chit chat. But I could only think about what's going on here. What what's going on? And she had taken the apron off and and put it on the counter. But she said, "Did you notice I was wearing an apron?" 
Well, I responded with, yes, of course I did, and that it was very beautiful. She said it belonged to my mother. Her mother, she told me, had come to this country from Great Britain as an infant and had traveled with her family. They were actually crossing the country uh, in a very primitive style. Uh, They were headed for California. They didn't make it that far. And they settled. They got to a point and settled. And she wasn't really sure why. Because her mother wasn't sure. Because her mother was an infant. And she never... Families are really good at keeping secrets. They don't share things. I think it's really because they don't think it's important. It's like, okay... We live that part of our life. It's done. It's over. We're living in today. And there's a lot to be said for that. Living in the past serves no purpose. But she began to talk about her family and and her mother and how she had at that at one time, Cora had family. She on on her mother's side. She said her father's side was a little bit more in the shadows. And she said the thing that that troubled her through the years, back in the day, people used their Bible as a record. They recorded births and deaths and marriages and sicknesses and all sorts of information in pages made into, literally sewn into the pages of Bibles for that very purpose. But she said when it came to her parents, that some of the dates had been changed. And she never had a clear vision of why. And she never got a clear answer from her, <laughs> from her mother about this information in the Bible. So be skeptical, people, of records kept in Bibles because it can be changed and it can be fixed, as it were. But over lunch, Cora spent a lot of time talking about her mother and her mother's religious beliefs, her mother's morals and and ethics, really, Uh which were of the highest caliber, according to Cora. She said her mother had turned gray when she was 18 years old, snow white, snow white hair. So while she kind of aged early, as time went on, she remained youthful, more youthful than her peers because her body and her complexion remained youthful. It was only the hair that aged. She said she brushed it 100 strokes every night and it was to her waist. And every morning she pulled it up into a tight little bun with the old fashioned hairpins. She said her mother did attend church some, but her mother in Cora's adult life, her mother traveled uh, around quite a bit. So it was sporadic when she would go to church, but she was a very spiritual person. And she said her mother is the one that instilled in her the idea of karma, which we've talked about already, about the karma in Cora's life. Now, She said to her mother, it was a very simple thing. Her mother was a very gentle person and would give a stern look and just say, remember about your behavior? What goes around comes around. And of course, it stuck with me. She said, for good or bad, (laughs) was what I was raised on. She said, which gives me pause on so many things 
in my life, she said, as you already know. Corey said, you know, the conversation that we had recently at the cemetery. <laughs> well, of course I did. That is not something to easily forget. She said, the strangest thing has happened and come into my life. She received some correspondence and then some follow-up correspondence and then some phone calls. Corey actually did have a grandchild. She had a grandson. She had a grandson that belonged to the son she believed had died from AIDS before AIDS was before it was uh, truly uh, recognized or when you could really uh, diagnose it properly but she firmly believed that from what she knew at present time and because of his symptoms and and, and his lifestyle and she was convinced of that but before he passed away he had taken a trip to California it, she said probably with his lover they probably went there to party and have a great time but while he was there in part of their sexual escapades he met a woman that he liked very much and she was part of a, a, a threesome that they that uh, her son had with his lover and this woman as a result of that here was a child that had been born and this child was now old enough to search and to find her through extensive research and work. And what he needed from her when he first contacted her, she said, was something to allow him to have a DNA, DNA test done. And she certainly complied with that because would this mean if it came back conclusive that her son was the father, that she indeed did have a grandchild, and yes, she did. And he was coming for a visit to meet her, and she was thrilled. She said, I'm practicing. I'm practicing being a little more fancy. And she said, I wanted to bring out my mother's apron to feel close to my mother as I am about to meet her great-grandchild. She said, from my lineage, from my descendant. She said, I can't put into words my joy and my happiness to know that I, I still have someone. I've missed all these years of his life, but he's still there, and I'm still here, she said. So there's much to be caught up on and there's so much to do and she said and I plan to do just that so she said I wanted to tell you in person and I wanted to share it over a meal because in life sharing meals breaking bread is important you do it with the people that mean something to you breaking bread she said and this important information needed to be shared as we broke bread together. So she said, you know, I thought my story was over, but it isn't. My story isn't over, Cora said.